I'm Todd Edman, and I'm happy to be here doing a presentation for Green Lane to talk a little bit about sustainability and how coronavirus is affecting that. And of course, I'm here from my home office, and there's some obvious things that, that we're going to talk about today that everyone's experiencing. But I try and stay up on trends and what people are writing about because that's part of my job. And I think there's um, some secondary effects that are really, really profound um, that I think are slightly less obvious. And I'm, I'm excited to share those with you today. And of course, I'm at home with my three kids. So if you hear, you know, playing in the background, that's a possibility as well. That, that we're seeing this stuff change. Um, and that's kind of grouping them into stuff that, that we kind of see. The first is that work from home is becoming the standard now. Uh, almost 50% of people who are still working today are actually working from home. And that's a pretty profound change, I think. Um, and th this virus is going to be impacting us for 12 to 18 months, probably um, at the soonest that we could see kind of life as normal return, which means a huge chunk of people are going to have to do things like change how they do care for their children, change how they commute, change the tools they use. The second is that food will change. And I bring this up in the context of business because I think it's actually um, tied to work from home as well. And it's also um, tied to where the general consciousness is going and that can affect all sorts of businesses, and indeed, um, agriculture is the largest single industry in the United States. And so it's, it's impossible for that change in food not to affect all business. And then lastly, cities will change. Um, and I think as we adopt remote work and food changes and all these fundamental components of, of how we identified ourselves in a society change, uh, we're gonna see cities change along with that. And so this is based on research that I'm doing uh, around venture capital, reading futurists, and um, just, you know, in general, trying to be involved in that discussion. So let's start with work from home. Again, 50% of people that are working still are working from home. And that impact, again, will last 12 to 18 months. So we're going to tool differently. We're going to develop uh, more robust home offices. We're going to develop more robust tools for working at home. Um, and all of that will change how we interact with our peers who are in the office. I actually see also a lot of commercial real estate um, dropping in value because there's going to be a number of companies that don't go back to having offices. Um, I think, uh, you know, companies that need to meet with clients in offices are going to retain their space, but most companies are probably going to thin down. Um, they're also going to change how desks are allocated. Desks will be a shared space and people will be working on different days. And I think that, that that's going to impact how um, offices are occupied. Another big factor is uh, uncertain childcare. So it's uncertain and unclear when childcare is going to spin back up, um, when ch children will be able to go back into daycare or back into um, different types of care. Um, and I think that that's actually likely to uh, have a profound pact on the childcare industry. And I think it's going to fragment it and, and change it quite a bit. Um, some of these childcare places are not going to be able to be down for 18 months and recover from it. So I think you're going to see an increase in home care and an increase in localized care where um, parents are, are having their kids cared for at locations closer to them. But it's going to be a while before people are willing to accept those risks. So that's going to fundamentally change um, child care. Um, and then last thing to talk about is computer tools that are going to adapt for work. Um, and primarily the thing that we're going to need to see is um, th there's kind of three different stages of work from home automation and work from home tools. One of the primary ones uh, is going to be tool sets to support asynchronous work. And uh, what I mean by asynchronous work is you think about it like someone gets the ball in an email of something they need to do and they might be one of five people in a chain that need to do something on an item. They'll do their part They'll send it on, they'll tack on the messages about the part they did and it'll get passed to the next person. Um, and that's kind of different than more kind of the hub, centralized hub and spoke model that we're in management style that we're used to today. And so as that happens, people will be adopting new tools to address that. So even the most computer, you know, unfriendly industries who have been the slowest to change are going to adopt tools um, like Slack, and task management tools at a much, much higher rate, um, a, a really extremely increased rate. 
in the next few months just to kind of deal with this crisis. And then I think it's likely that that's going to be um, a thing that doesn't change back after the crisis begins to, to be over in 12 to 18 months. The other thing that's going to change a lot is food. So small food is currently in big trouble. Uh, it was before this um, crisis struck us. Um, you saw more and more food being grow grown by small and medium producers. They're, they're actually responsible for all of the growth in the food industry over the last decade. So um, the food industry grew has been growing at about a uh, three to four and we have more but small farms are growing seven percent to eight percent so they represented all of the growth and where large farms are growing it's because they've purchased smaller farms but despite that they're having declining margins and a smaller share of the food dollar and that has made it really hard for them to continue to function in business they're going out of business before this disaster at a record rate and now we're seeing you know all the farmer markets close which is a primary way a lot of these farms got to market so the ones that are going to survive are the ones that are going to be able to take their food online the ones that are going to be working with food hubs um, and the ones that are going to be able to transition to sort of a new distribution model that doesn't fit the standard models. And let me take a second to talk a little bit about food hubs because I think that's a big thing that's going on. Uh, I was talking to Amy McCann, who has the local food marketplace. They normally in the past have onboarded somewhere around 50 people um, a year. That's been their clip. Um, in the second week of the crisis, they onboarded, I think she said, 15 or 16 people. So, you know, you look at that rate and you're like, wow, that's uh, more than 10 times an increase. And I've called around to a lot of these food hubs and they're servicing a few hundred people, which is well beyond their, um, you know, current comfort zone. And the, most of them have waiting lists. So people are making this shift. If they're going to order at home, they want it to be a different type of food than they were getting in the grocery store. I think there's this fundamental shift that has taken place in people's psychology around food that's super important to understand for all business people. And that is when you go into a grocery store and you've never had to worry about it before, but you go into a grocery store and there's food there that you've come to count on, you start thinking to yourself, where am I going to get my food? And that's making people reevaluate where they're buying food. They're going to farms to try and buy it. They're going to food hubs who are making connections with local providers. And I think this is a seismic shift that is going to have massive long-term implications. Even as we return to normal, there's still going to be large chunks of the population, people who have been smokers in the past, people who have asthma problems, who are not going to feel comfortable going out. They're going to want to rely more on working at home and ordering food in at home. And that is going to push forward a massive shift that no big company is actually really ready to address. So even, even Amazon and Instacart aren't ready to address uh, the delivery at home market that is massively, massively going to shift and massively going to change where food comes from. So I, I think that the end impact will be a huge positive step forward with a decrease in food miles because people are looking to change their buying behavior and have a different relationship with their food, have a different relationship with their beverages. I think about um, end of World War II or World War II shifts that occurred that we never moved back from um, as this type of scale. And one of those was that women worked in factories and it caused a massive shift in the labor force of availability in the United States. Suddenly our labor force was comprised of 50% more people effectively. And I think that, you know, we never ever went back to that um, sort of male, completely male dominated, you know, um, women not working in the workforce. And that was a hugely positive change, both for our culture and for our economy. And I think we're about to see that same sort of seismic shift um, in food where people do want to rely on local food more and um, do want to, um, you know, shift their buying habits. And those will not shift back, I believe, um, in the years to come. Technology has given small producers and um, food hubs the ability to actually service consumers at a really high level that I, I believe that grocery stores in the long run are going to be challenged um, to, to deal with. And I don't think they'll be able to make the same shift for five years to 10 years. 
So um, part of this is looking at the food supply chain and deconstructing that piece um, and just talking about these pieces. So farms currently get 13% of the wholesale dollar. I think you're going to see that expand as a lot of these pieces um, in the middle end up getting dis uh, decreased. One of those is looking at distribution. So uh, distribution, heavy trucking, um, of heavy trucking, you're, you're talking like over a third that is long haul that's doing food. Um, so you're gonna see a big decrease, I think, in long haul trucking that's doing food. 40% of distribution, uh, or sorry, 50% of distribution is actually spent doing food distribution from large distributors in downtown. The food hubs are gonna change that massively. They're going to shift that cost from fuel costs to manual labor. You're gonna see more localized food hubs using more manual labor and using alternative sources for delivery. So instead of a big box truck making um, 15 stops in a day, I think you're much more likely to see cargo bikes um, and alternative electric vehicles being tapped to make those distribution decisions. And then shortly, I think this is also going to move forward uh, the awareness uh, and the need for autonomous delivery vehicles. I think that is actually going to be a pretty profound shift too. Um, in the middle, again, you're going to see processing change, less processed foods. That's, that's going to happen. Packaging is going to go down. Storage is going to be decreased. So all of these things in the middle will expand and that will be distributed between local food hubs and also local farms, which I think is a profoundly good thing for our world and our society. Um, and then cities are gonna change. Uh, so because of this not work from home, when people are hiring for mobile offices, they really will not care nearly as much where people are located. Um, and this is already a trend we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years, especially since tools have gotten better. But really, I think you're gonna see companies, more than half their workforce is gonna become remote, which means that it's gonna be much more practical to live in a city like Eugene and have a top job. Um, and I think that is actually going to change the demographics of the city. Um, not that everyone's going to flee from a city, but this long-term impact will create, I think, unlike the last downturn, which actually limited people's income mobility and limited their ability to, to move, um, this downturn will not have that impact. I think people are going to become more mobile. They're going to move to a wider variety of places and less be and be consolidated less in cities. Um, just to be aware, I think commercial real estate and urban multifamily units um, are both going to struggle because of this shift. Um, they're already going to struggle because a big piece of their work is um, and has been largely focused uh, around servicing people who are going to live in urban cores. I'm going to shut my door for just a second. And I think that when you look at that, you go, okay, so if that's gonna happen and that shift is gonna happen in commercial real estate where people aren't gonna move back as quickly or they're not going to um, move back into offices as quickly, that, that, that massive shift is gonna really hit urban real estate and multifamily real estate. Um, what, what that means is you'll see less investment in those areas in the coming decade um, as the previous money from that investment it, um, flows in a different direction. Um, and I think that actually may ease some of the um, problems with uh, urban housing, um, which will actually be a good thing. Um, and then the next thing is, is educational flexibility. So schools probably, I don't believe schools in Oregon or California are gonna go back um, in the fall. That's my, my personal belief. And that's based on, um, again, uh, we'll, we'll see some of the states that are lifting restrictions, whether or not they have um, increased transmission rates. But I, I don't think we're going to have a vaccine any, anytime soon. And schools are going to be places of mass transmission. And I think it's going to be really hard for us to be willing to take that risk. So schools are going to be pushed to develop more online tools. More people are going to be um, attending schools remotely. And I think that that's going to become more of a socially acceptable thing. And um, that that could be very good for education. Um, it also could have some negative impacts where people and kids who maybe are in um, difficult situations, living situations, might become more challenged in getting help. So 
I, I think our schools and our educational service districts are actually um, going to be changing a lot and trying to adapt to those new challenges. But again, on the whole, I, I do see some very, very positive things coming out of, of those changes. Um, I've got a display up here. Sorry, Teresa and Green Lane folks. I am not able to get my slideshow moving forward. Okay. There we go. My problem apparently is that I cannot see my mouse. There we go. Something. Okay, so now that's how I think cities will change. And so I, I think what becomes the question is that during these shakeups and these times of tremendous change, that we really do have the opportunity to kind of explore the world and see the world the way we'd like to see it, make, remake the world the way we'd like to see it. I think we can look at our cities and begin asking ourselves the question is, is the infrastructure that's been put in place the best use? Um, is the model of having a giant 40,000 square foot where it rest, uh, warehouse 15 miles out of the city and making repeat large truck stops a good use of energy in the city? Um, or can we localize food more? Can we decrease commuting? Um, and then I think it's bringing forward the question of things like universal childcare, where Look, if um, child care facilities need to be regulated in a different way and that it needs to be more universal, can we create a delocalized um, child care credit where um, the child care people are, are paid directly to care for kids and meet certain regulatory requirements to allow for a kind of a different model in child care? And I, I'm, I'm actually very hopeful about that because um, I think that that's going to have a massive positive impact on um, women in the workforce and also the work from home and also commuting and, and education and all sorts of wonderful things that could come out of that. And then the last thing I think is going to be a very interesting question is basic income. We're going to have a lot of unemployed people. Restaurants are going to have to un open up slowly. Um, and the additional subsidies in uh, unemployment and the extension of unemployment is going to keep sections of the economy flowing that would have not otherwise been flown. Uh, would have ever otherwise been consumed. Um, people are worried about consumer spending because it's the largest piece of the driver where if consumers have no money because they're unemployed, they don't spend. And if they have money, even if it comes from the government, they'll spend a higher portion of it. They actually say less of it because they feel more secure, which could actually drive gross domestic product growth. So my background is as an economist and there's economists having lots of interesting conversations about this. And kind of saying like if we want to keep taxable income rolling in and keeping the economy moving along um, in a way that doesn't see massive GDP drop, basic income is, is a realistic consideration we should be looking at. I think, you know, uh, it's really interesting that not only is this crisis happening when we were in a massive upswing, the longest period of positive economic growth in our, in, in our memory, but I think it's also happening at a time when we're seeing things like blockchain, decentralized transactions, um, artificial intelligence replacing jobs, autonomous vehicles that are electric running in cities, um, autonomous trucking, and, and new technologies like widespread broadband brought to us by 5G, all happening at the same time. The, it, to have it happen, have this disaster and this crisis happen now, to see all these people dying now, and then they'd be looking forward five years and the impact and the acceleration this will have on technology, which will largely impact um, sustainability in extremely positive ways is pretty amazing. It really is accelerating paths to all of these sorts of new techs. And I just hope that um, along with that, that we take the advantage that we have to make decisions as consumers and individuals to build better relationships with our food, better relationships with our work, better relationships with our children and education, better relationships with our communities, 
as a piece of that. So the future is here. This is our opportunity to build the future that we want to see. And I really am looking forward to participating in my own consumer choices and making those in such a way that uh, help that happen. Thanks very much. I'm Todd Edmund, one of the co-founders of BitCork. And it was great to be here today to talk with you about sustainability, the COVID crisis, and what impact that's going to have on business. Thanks.